not just to develop local or regional pride and identity, but that all these will one day be woven into a tapestry that is one inclusive history that forms and informs our national identity. There is no better way to open our conference than with a quote from T.S. Eliot's Four Quartets. I'm sorry I use this all the time, but there is no better way to say it. And we start with these words. What we call the beginning is often the end, and to make an end is to make a beginning. The end is where we start from. Let me start then, as Eliot says, from the end to make a beginning. When I first saw the call for papers at this conference, I dug out of my files all Manila envelopes marked food, and what came out was a copy of Mariano Enson's 1968 mimeograph, Cusinal Kapampanan, inscribed on the flyleaf with the dedication to the Aguilar Cruz, who later drew a boy mixing chocolate on it. Henson's table of contents alone is worth a paper in this conference because it not only gives us serving size in bandejados, and we don't know how big or small those are, it also gives us the price of the ingredients in 1936. Henson actually planned to present 150 recipes but only came up to 133. And while we, could, we can recognize kapangkangan dishes like pansit luglug, sigang, ilawin, adobo, manok at babi, lagat repolyo, suwamari, suwamais karaniwan, so I don't know what suwamais special is like, there was asado pampango, bulanglang, bangus, debukan, etc. Henson was cosmopolitan, so his kapangkangan cookbook also includes lutong in chick or Chinese dishes like kimchi jie, kui wan, and hao yao dai kao, pansit miki, and bihon. Four centuries of Spanish cuisine are represented in cocido a la española, pescado en blanco, lengua a la marinera, morisqueta tostada, which is actually fried rice, asado de cerdo, bacalao a la vizcaina, etc. And some Spanish dishes, using local ingredients were listed as croquetas balatong mais, albondigas babi at paro, salsa tamatis, and chuletas balacenas. French dishes are to be found in this cookbook too. Fish filet with bernese sauce, paro a la creole, creme de la creme, salmo au gratin, bouillabaisse de Marseille, Oysters a la Duxel, Mechado Solomillo a la Francesca. Very Catholic, meaning universal, in his tastes, Henson included in the Kapampanan kitchen American, Italian, Polish, Mexican, Turkish, and other dishes that were indigenized for me to his own taste. Nayon King Paglasa ng Sarili, as he says. Now, Henson's 1968 mimeograph, Kapampanan kitchen, was translated from the Kapampara into English as Finger Licking Pampanga Dedicacies in 1974. That grew to 163 recipes or an increase of 30 more recipes than the original. Recipe number one, curry, as you can see, was translated, but the 1936 prices unfortunately were omitted. The same for macaroni recipe number two, where evaporada alpine in 1936 becomes alpine evaporated milk in 1974. Mantequilla in 1936 becomes butter in 1974. And the changes are not just linguistic but technological. The ice box or the vera of 1936 became the refrigerator of 1974. And more importantly, the garnish of asparagus and artichoke in 1936 is omitted in 1974. If I had the time, I would compare and contrast these two texts, extracting from them not just culinary history, but more importantly, the social history that both informs and contextualizes the food. 
In the 1936 edition, for example, recipe number 22 is for Commonwealth Gulai. And I wonder what Keson would think of Commonwealth Gulai. Then there is another recipe, recipe 141, which I want to kitchen test because this is the famous bola bolas of Ateneo de Manila that Henson remarked was, quote, how we eat them in the Spanish Ateneo de Manila since Dr. Jose Rizal's time, unquote. I also wanted to look, after Henson, into a cookbook that was called Pamag Conserva at Pamag Lutong Filipino that I found in the library of Sofia University in Tokyo. Published in 1934, this book by Pura Villanueva Calao, and not mentioned in the title page Maria Rosa, was actually translated from the original Tagalog Pagconserva at Mga Paglulutong Filipino. The title actually on the cover slightly different uh, from that in the uh, title page. Okay, I'll just show you what it looks like. From this, I wanted to go into earlier cookbooks I have on file. There is La Cocina Filipina from 1913 and Condimientos Indígenas by Pura Villanueva Cala from 1918. There was also another one called uh, Aklat ng Pagluluto, published in 1919. Then we have manuscript sources. In the notebooks and newspapers of the ill-fated Juliana Goricho, mother-in-law of Juan Luna, who is fascinating not because of her death, but because she tried to replicate the tastes of home of the Philippines in late 19th century Paris. On January 1, 1886, for example, Doña Juliana cooked a New Year's meal for 10 people that included the painters Rafael Enriquez, Gaston O'Farrell, Juan Luna, and Felix Resurrection Hidalgo. On October 11, 1891, she made meatballs for almonicas for 10 people that included Jose Rizal, Fernando Cano, a certain girl, and the Kapampangan Valentin Ventura. So from some of Juliana's recipes, we can get a taste of what our heroes ate. In 1991, when I first traveled abroad, just like president of the university, uh, I first traveled abroad for postgraduate studies, my mother asked her secretary to type out a survival cookbook that was a mix of recipes that I grew up with. As a mother, she knew that this would remind me of home, away from home. Remember, there was no Jollibee abroad then. There were no real Pinoy restaurants in London aside from Lutung Bahai in Earl's Court. And unlike today, Asian, rest, Asian stores then did not have Pinoy staples like chippy, patis, adobo mix, uh, magic salak, or sinigang buyon. So I was forced to cook from scratch using available ingredients. My mother's paksiw and sinigang and uh, dye in the bagus, because there was no bagus there, was substituted with prout. And with no tamarind, so when you look at this, with no tamarind for sinigang, the sounding agent was replicated with tomatoes, and I was told later, best with a dash of lemon. I realized by cooking by myself and looking at other cuisines that I could replicate the tastes of food using the ingredients that were available. Mashed blood sausages in vinegar could replicate ginguan. Smoked herring was the closest to tinapa. Beef tapa was just sirloin kneaded in a salt-sugar mixture. But now I know from my, I taught last term in the University of Michigan, it was the winter, and I found out that I didn't have to do my own beef tapa because all I had to do was to buy teriyaki flavored beef jerky. And with fried egg, you have already your stuff. Recipes are about identity. The Goricho recipes and those of my mother for expatriate Pinoys remain, reminded me of another manuscript that I have wanted to work on for the last four decades, 
but never got around to doing it. This is actually an 18th century Augustinian friar cookbook, Tratado de Varios Visados y Conservas. And when I looked at it for this paper, I found out that it has a recipe for tinola, and it also references local ingredients like camias and malimbing. It has a recipe for longaniza. It has uh, mentions preserves made of malimbing. And there are also what it calls aleang sampalo, and it seems aleang santo. So the thing here is this is a Spanish friar who's trying to replicate the food that he has from home using local ingredients. So, following the example of Feliz Santa Maria, I should actually organize my papers and find a repository for them because I'm sure younger scholars will be able to make good use of them. I have benefited from the stray papers in the libraries of older scholars and writers like E. Aguilar Cruz, Hilda Cordero Fernando, Armando Malay, Arsenio Manuel, and many others. I can only hope younger scholars can make sense of my many, many notebooks. I caught Brillante Mendoza's 2022 film Apag on Netflix recently, and I wondered if anyone has worked on food on film and television. From Philippine literature, every no everyone knows about the food references in the novels of Jose Rizal. But what about the food in the novels and short stories of Nick Joaquin, F. Shonin Jose, Amado Hernandez, and others? References in the Noli and Fili suggest that Rizal knew how to cook. And his family regularly sent him noodles when he was studying abroad. And the Kapalpangan Jose Alejandrino mentions an unforgettable experience with Pansil. From Rizal's adolescent diary, Memorias de un Estudiante de Manila, we see a description of his typical day, when his breakfast was generally, consist generally consisted of a plate of rice and two sardinas secas. Literally translated, that means dried sardines that every Pinoy knows as tuyo. In chapter 3 of Noli Metangere, okay, Capitan Chago has tinola on the menu at the Bienvenida or Welcome Home Dinner for Ibarra because Capitan Chago knows that Ibarra had not had it for many years that he was in Europe. What makes Rizal's tinola different from ours is the use of calabaza instead of green papaya or sayote. As a social document, Rizal tells us that when the soup is portioned and served, Padre Damaso got quote, the bad parts of the chicken, which was basically a neck without skin and a hard wing, while everyone else had piernas and pechugas or legs and breasts. But Ibarra was the lucky one. He scooped up the menudillos or the balunbaluna. In chapter 23, The Fishing Expedition, Rizal gives us the pairings for breakfast beverages and what senses these things stimulate. For example, he says, Salabat and Puto gave one an appetite for prayer. <laughs> Coffee, by itself, in stimulated happy thoughts. Tea with biscuits or cookies soothes one's thoughts. And chocolate was served and was taken as long as lunch was not delayed too much. We remember, and for me this is significant, that when I first went to Cafe Adriatico, I had their chocolate, and it was the chocolate egg, which they explained was part of this the novels of Rizal. So they cited, there was a little sign in the cafe that cited chapter 11 of the Noli where one knew the importance of a visitor depending on the chocolate that was served. Chocolate E meant a rich and thick beverage while chocolate A was aguado or watered down. Returning to chapter 23, the fishing expedition 
We see how people ate freshly cooked meals, even on a picnic. The fish was kept alive in a net attached to the banka, and when needed, was taken straight from the water to the boiling sinigang broth. The person cooking the sinigang was Andeng, who had the reputation as a good cook. She was probably Kapampangan. And uh, for this sinigang, she prepared rice water with tomatoes and kamyas as a souring agent. And the young, other young people cleaned calabasa flowers um, and the beans, cutting paaya in short pieces the length of cigarettes. Then the paintings for fish are given by Rizal. A union, uh, according to Rizal, is good for sinigang. Okay. And bia, which looks like that, is good for escabeche. Danat and buwan buwan are good for pesa, especially the mudfish that can live long out of water. Lobsters were set to the frying pan. Bana was broiled in banana leaf stuffed with tomatoes. So you can see here that Rizal actually knew what he wanted. If he didn't know how to cook, he gave us the thing that is what makes Filipino cuisine what it is. In the manuscript of the Fili, go now to the Fili, we see something else. <coughs> the manuscript of the Fili, we see a draft for chapter 24 that was originally titled In the Panseteria. But Rizal changed his mind, and in the printed version, the title became Risas Ilyantos, Laughter and Crying. The Panciteria, which is called the Panciteria Macanista de Buen Gusto, or the Macau Panciteria of Good Taste, was not made up, but it existed long after Rizal's execution. It used to stand on a site now occupied by a building. So if you go to Binondo today, you go to San Fernando Bridge, and you look at Binondo Church ahead, uh, you will see that it is, the site is actually this white building here on the left. But if you are nostalgic, as some people are, they imagine the Panceteria in the abandoned old structure beside the first building. What was interesting was that in a pre-war photo, you can clearly see on the side of this building the sign Panciteria de Macanista, Macanista de Buen Gusto. And it is unfortunate that people who grew up using the Charles Derbyshire translations of Rizal's novels will never enjoy all this detail because he didn't think the Filipiniana was relevant and he deleted most of it. So all the food sources are gone, all the funny parts are gone. So I hope that you will read a more complete version of the Noli and the Fili in order to understand what a funny and wonderful writer Rizal actually is. Speaking of Panciterias, the present Toho Panciteria claims to be the Panciteria Antigua or Old Panciteria, the oldest in the country, tracing its foundation to 1888. My father doesn't remember Panciteria Antigua, but he says that post-war, they used to go to a place called the Panciteria Moderna. So there was an old one and a new one. And when I went to Binondo, I said, maybe I should look for this. Panciteria Antigua is there. Moderna is not there anymore. But when I searched online, I found out that there exists what is called the new Panciteria Moderna. So it means, hindi lang modern, new pa siya. <laughs> so, what you see here is, food and history are not so much about eating and remembering, but more about connecting and connections. And I'd like to say the today, especially to the young people who are here, that the world has lost its appreciation for useless information. The world has become a lesser place because they think 
trivia is useless information. And as I will show you, I am a fountain of useless information. Look at this. When we look at a picture like this, and I often show this to my students, and you ask them, what are these? And they will answer, Tansa. But people do not know why they are called Tansa. And if you go to pre-war uh, uh, periodicals, you will find out that there was a Japanese pre-war brand of carbonated water called Tansa that had metal bottle caps when people were still using cork to seal bottles. So therefore, it was, it was used in Tansa. It's just like when we call all toothpaste cold game or all refrigerators frigid air, uh, the Tansa got its name. But when you go to Japan, you will find out that the Japanese word for carbonated water is Tansa. Iconic silver swan soy sauce, I thought, was named after a silver swan until I found out that its founder was actually Sihun Swan. So it sounds like silver swan. Yeah? Um, it's like when people say bench, if I think of a bench, it's actually Ben Chan. But this one is really amazing, Mr. Sihun Swan, who created that iconic black soy sauce. Then we come to Rufina Patis. No, uh, <clears throat> I found out when I went to the Visayas that when you ask for patis, they will give you toyo or soy sauce. And if you wanted patis or fish sauce, you ask for Rufina. So it shows you how even by the names of the things that we, we eat and things that we put in our tetila, we find a lot of history in it. One of the popular songs of the Spanish-American and Philippine-American wars at the turn of the 20th century was A Hot Time in the Old Town. And the soldiers used to sing it and it said, A Hot Time in the Old Town Tonight, which gave us the dish called Hoto Tai, because it's Hot Time in the Old Town Tonight. So what you actually see here is that finding connections requires an appreciation for useless information. I will give you one last important uh, connection. People always think that Halo is Filipino. It is not, because we're a tropical country and we did not have ice until the late 19th century. And people now know it, I've written it, and now it's like common knowledge, but it was not common until I had found it, was when I was teaching in Japan, one of the things that I enjoyed the most was in the summer when I see this blue sign. I'm so happy because I can buy the shaved ice with um, sweet syrup. This thing is called kakigori. And it has been in Japan for a thousand years. No? In the 10th century Japanese pillow book, it is described as the woman they gave a list of elegant things, and the elegant things were duck eggs, a rosary of rock crystal, snow. But the thing there is, it says, shaved ice with liana syrup served in a silver bowl was one of the elegant objects. And they were already mentioning it in the 10th century. Now, Haruhalo is actually an indigenized category. I found out later that our Halo Halo or Mix Mix actually started because the Japanese before World War II were the ones who were selling uh, sweetened beans, no, uh, which we put in our Halo Halo. Um, then you also find out that the ingredients, no, when we, we do the Halo Halo, the Japanese put the ingredients on top of the ice but the Filipinos have their own, the ingredients are under the ice. So what we see here is that Halo Halo has become our own. We made Halo Halo our own and today you have the Rasons, you have the big thing, you have everything. And it closed already, I was so amused many years ago because there used to be in Angeles a competitor to Rasons which was called Corazons. No, um, so we see here that it is not just in the Philippines that you have Halo Halo, but there are cousins of the Halo Halo. Taiwan has Chua Malaysia has Ice Kachang, 
uh, Vietnam has Chaba Mao, uh, Thailand has Nocho, and all of the, the common denominator, the common ingredient is always shaved ice. These are all descended from the Japanese category. Um, I found out when I was doing research that we could not have had, had, had Halo Halo until the 19th century was when ice came to the Philippines. And it was ice that was imported all the way from Boston. So it came from a place called Wenham Lake, and this was the ice that was so pure that Queen Victoria only drank ice from this lake. So what happened was they would cut whole chunks of ice from the lake, load them into ice ships, and the ice ships took them from the U.S. all the way down to India and Australia with a stop in the Philippines, the stop in Manila. So when you look at it, when I was living in Japan, I found out that the Hano Hano had come full circle. It has Japanese roots, became ours, and then one summer I saw in all the convenience stores what I thought was Ilo Ilo, ni pala Ilo Ilo, Haro Haro pala yan. No? So they had their own version of what was Halo Halo. So when we look at it, is this mere adaptation or indigenization? Or is it, as Kidlat Bahini calls, indiogenization? You know, when you think about it, when Maria Orosa invented banana ketchup as a substitute for tomato ketchup, little did she know that it would lead to the sweet Filipino spaghetti, which is not Italian spaghetti, it is our own, our Filipino spaghetti, which Kidla Tahimi rightfully describes as Indio genius. So let's take one last significant example. And this you probably are uh, familiar with. It is what the founding fathers of this nation ate in Manolos in 1898. So this is them marching off uh, from Manolos to Barasuahim. Uh, this is Emilio Aguinaldo, who was uh, who arrived, uh, arrived in a state, it's called the state carriage. Very wonderful. It has four white horses, even has a guy with with a uh, uniform, he has liberated footmen with people and wigs. I was so impressed until I found out that this state carriage para was known from the neighborhood funeraria. But anyway, uh, let's not look at that. Let us look at the Manolos Congress and one of their acts was to ratify Philippine independence that was declared in Kamit on June 12, 1898. We have only known the Malolos menu from pictures, from a picture, black and white picture, in Harper's History of the War. But I was very happy last year to find out that a young collector named Melvin Young was able to buy from the U.S. a, a copy of the Malolos menu. So that's me. It shows you how small it is. It's in the shape of a flag that says the solemn ratification of Philippine independence. And when you open it, it will reveal the menu. And if you look at the menu, there are three words there. It says fraternity, quality, liberty, the rallying cries of the French Revolution. On the top, you will see the date on which this uh, wonderful lunch was, was taken. It was 29 September 1898, and it is a menu for lunch. For starters, they had oysters, shrimp in butter, radish, olives, Leon sausages, sardines in tomato sauce, and Holland salmon. For the uh, main course, they had crabs, bonobon, chicken, lamb chops with potatoes, truffle turkey, a steak, and green beans. Note here, that everything becomes social when it is French and it becomes sounds more expensive. Because when you think of it, the coquille de crab is actually torta alimago. And the abati de poulet is actually a la tagal, is actually chicken adobo. So when you make it into French, it becomes much grander. The dessert that they had were cheese, fruit, jam, strawberry jelly, and ice cream. 
The wines were Bordeaux, Sauterne, Sherry, and Champagne. Their liquor was Chartreuse, which is a green, awful liquor that tastes like cough syrup. Uh, they had cognac, and to end, they had coffee and tea. What they ate was all for show. It was about who they were, who they wanted to be. And so when I was thinking of it, one day, when I was in the, uh, the museum in the Xavier University in Cagayan de Oro, wow, I saw they had a menu. And I said, and that was the first time I had seen an original one. And so I took a picture, I didn't really mind it, but when I read it, I found out that the menu was different from the one that we knew. The, the, the menu was actually a dinner. And uh, Jean Gonzalez, who is here with us, you know, uh, has done a replication of these dinners. I attended one in 1998. It took us three hours to finish the entire meal. But it shows you what it's like, what they ate. And so we can compare the lunch and the dinner, and maybe one day someone will not only write about it, but will be able to cook it and replicate it. What is important here is that Nick Joaquin said very early that the menu of Manolos should be appreciated together with the Manolos Constitution because it is who our founding fathers imagined themselves to be and it is who, unfortunately or fortunately, we imagine ourselves to be. So what I have done this morning is basically to show you method. It is not to talk about a compound food, which you will hear about in the next few days, but to give you some method. The true magic of history, I have found out, is not in memorizing the dates. It is actually in finding connections between the data. The true magic of history also is not in its connection, it lies in its relevance. If history is not relevant to you, it doesn't have the power to inspire, doesn't have the power to move us. So what I am going to conclude with is that food shows us, not just Kapampangan food, but Iloilo food, Bacolod food, etc. Our food shows us that we are not one history, but we are made of many Philippine histories. Textbook history that I have been teaching for the past 40 years, I realize now that when we study a history, it's always the struggle, the anti colonial struggle. It's always about the revolution, it's always about wars. But what I realize now is that food teaches us that it can be seen in a different way. Food is an expression of Filipino agency in history. We always think, I the foreigners came and they gave us these things and we just accepted them. No, we did not. So when you hear Pinoy Champurado, remember that it was descended from a Mexican Champurado, which tastes differently. Our Pampano Tamales is different from the Mexican Tamales. Or our Brinhi is different from the Paella Valenciana. Or if we are to believe the late Serafim Tiazon, uh, the Brinhi is actually from Biryani. So the thing here is, I want to talk about, and I want to end by saying that we should look not just into Kapampangan food being what it is, but to look at the process. Because by taking the foreign and making it our own, by taking the foreign, we have made certain dishes Kapampangan. By taking the foreign, we have made it our own and made it Filipino. Adaptation and indigenization, therefore, should be seen as patterns of resistance. People do not see it in that way, but you can see that it was our way of resisting what was foreign and creating an identity which is our own. So, what should we do today, and what is it that I always counsel people? It is not so much to remember history, but it is actually to move, to liberate ourselves from the past. 
And how do we do it? It is by knowing it, it is by digesting it, and it is by making it our own. The best way to look at history is to remember your control pad in your house. Because history is like that. You can rewind, you can fast forward, or more importantly, we can delete. <laughs> so, in this conference, we will see many aspects of Kapampangan food and many aspects that make us not just Kapampangan, but Filipino. And therefore, we end with TSL Elliot again. Because like my keynote and all the other presentations in this conference, we shall not cease from exploration. And the end of all our exploring will be to arrive at the place where we started and we will know the place like the first time. Today, I showed you things that we think we know about, something simple like Tansan, but then when we explore and come back, we will see the ordinary Tansan and see it like we see it for the first time. Maya Paradote.